Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. I'd like to uh, welcome our guest for the show today. And our guest today is Robert Christensen. And he is the president of the Motive for Life. And on this show, we're going to be talking about what Motive for Life is and what their goals are, but more specifically, how all of us can begin to work on our own uh, self-worth and our self-esteem and how we all bring that together into finding what our inner peace is. Many times what we do, and I, I know I've done this in my own life, we sabotage the good. And part of that comes into uh, what Robert does and comes into the whole notion of of our self-worth. So this should be a very uh, interesting conversation that will bring up a a lot of practical life tips uh, for all of us. So thank you for being with us, Robert. Sounds good. I look forward to talking with you. Wonderful. So if you can uh, just share with the audience a a bit about yourself and uh, what brings you to the motive for life. Yeah, Chris, I I think one of the things that um, has really uh, come to the surface for me as I've gotten a little older in life is that I tended to cycle through successes and failures um, over Mm -hmm. my uh, years. So you know, um, you know, I've, I'm an entrepreneur. I've started a lot of companies, uh, three companies, um, and I would get them to a certain point uh, in the technology industry specifically, you know, um, and for some reason, my foot would come off the accelerator, right? I'd have this great idea. I knew it was good. I'd be ahead of the market and something would happen that would derail me. And <laughs> Um, I would get either distracted. Uh, my wife likes to say I get shiny object syndrome, right? And you, uh, like in the movie Up, the squirrel, right? You know, and I yep. I'd go someplace else and get a better idea, but I never would follow through. Um, and I kind of looked at it the same as you know, if I was trying to lose a little weight, right? Um, uh, I would have a whole lot of um, good intentions and actually some really good actions around changing my diet, my behavior, and stuff like that. But then for some reason, I would just stop doing it. And, Hmm. you know, a lot of folks in in the recovery world call those character defects, right? And they, you know, these things like you just start eating sugar again, you get angry at people, whatever. So, you know, I've been in the technology industry my whole life. I've been uh, in computers since I was 16 in, you know, 1979. Um, And, uh, seen a lot of changes go on. So like that's so why I had a lot of opportunities for success, you know, and, um, but I always ran into this, you know, ceiling, if you would. So hopefully um, uh, a lot of the stuff that we're coming to the surface now over the last, uh, I guess, seven, eight years of my life has really shown me that there was a key uh, variable or a key keystone, if you would, to my success. And that was my worthiness or my core belief of what I do believe I deserved in success. So when you said um, uh, sabotaging my own success, boy, that really just rings a bell with me because I would have success after success only to literally light a match and burn it down, not knowing what, how I did it or why I did it. Right. Um, so motive for life is about helping people understand what success means to them. It could be money. It could be a relationship. It could be a physical health, right? It could mean a number of things. But more importantly, how to keep the success once it starts showing up. 
this is the part that always gets people. It's not so hard to knuckle up and, and pull it together once I'm failing. And most people seem to be able to good at that. Uh, we see communities come together and all sorts of things, right? Look what's happening down in Houston right now. So people come together when we're, when we're really pushed up against, but when we're succeeding, uh, people, people do crazy things. <laughs> they do, they do <laughs> wacky things, right? So oh, yes. That's what it's all about. And so the, my book um, that's coming out here at the beginning of September is called The Bug in Our Brain. And the bug that's in our brain is the worthiness bug. It's, it's, a, it's a weird bug, and there's actually some things we can do about it. And, you know, I, I agree in what you're saying that, you know, when it really comes down to it, we will pull together and, and help each other out. And we tend to find that self-worth when the going gets tough. But right. when everything is going right in life, I seem to forget that. Or, or, is, or is there's something else going on, uh, you know, that you find in that. Because that, that is what I see. And, and even in my years, you know, you, you bring up, uh, you know, recovery and, uh, you know, addictions and, and how we get on with that is a lot of times the people in, especially in early recovery where they messed up was when everything was going right. But when they were having troubles in life and you thought they might go back to the drink or the drug, uh, they didn't. And then life is going wonderful. And I get that phone call, you know, Hey, I, I'm using again, you know, and, and it's like, well, whoa, what happened? You made it through the tough part and now life is great and, and you're using. That's so, right. What, what, what do you attribute to this? It's worthiness. And it's, um, you know, I've worked with many thousands of over the years. Um, I've been in recovery for 30 years and I've been engaged with uh, many, many, many men and women. And I've always asked myself, why would they stop doing the things that are good for them? Exactly. This is the, the question that perplexes everybody. And, they, and, you know, I think generically we whitewash it and call it alcoholism or drug addiction, right? Right. Without and, and then they'll say, hey, the ego stepped in and you were making too much money for what you should be doing and what you should be grateful and you need to be humble. And I just wasn't satisfied with that. You know, I got to be, you know, maybe 20 years in, uh, of having some time under my belt. And I thought to myself, you know, um, I'm not comfortable with the way things are going. I was continuing to self-sabotage while having done all the right things in recovery. Right. But I watched all my folks that I've been working with, you know, get, they get drunk or use and they die or they do something like that. And that was a much bigger problem than just whether or not I was successful. So, you know, that's where kind of we let, we, I, I jumped off on it. Right. And said, Hey, this is a huge issue that we're dealing with. Why are people leaving when it's getting good? You know, and uh, you see that yourself too, right? Oh, most definitely. That's, I've seen it often in, in my clients and, I, I now talk to them about that in, in the sense of saying, you know, here at the beginning when, you know, life is still a struggle and you're still working on, uh, you know, a lot of the cravings and a lot of your issues, you're probably going to do well. And one of the things that I notice is part of the reason they're doing well, they're actually doing what they need to be doing. Right. And then over time, we slack off on what we need to be doing. And like in what you say, you know, we, we stop doing those things that have actually helped us, you know, and yeah. how many times people would say to me, you know, well, I, I stopped going to my meetings, you know, well, why did you stop going to your meetings? Uh, well, because I wasn't drinking anymore. Okay, that's well, right. that's great. <laughs> but did you ever think that the reason was, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, you know, so Chris, there's a, there's a piece here and, um, and you know, I'll get, get right to it. So instead of uh, uh, um, being around a bush, what we found is this is that um, early in life, we get imprinted with a set of uh, language, images, and emotions that happen mm -hmm. sometime between the ages of, of three when you start gaining this downloading period till about age 11 or 12, somewhere in there. And it depends on the brain's chemistry and who, what the environments are, et cetera. So it's, everybody's kind of fuzzy around the time frame. But during this time frame of your young childhood, you're, you're downloading and you're imprinting in your brain. And what happens is, is that you have no discernment. What that means is, is that as a young child, you do not know 
what is right and what is wrong. You just understand what is being told and what your environment is like. So whether you come from an abusive family or a lot of uh, verbal violent, verbal um, language, or you come from a, an environment where abandonment was an issue, or you may have had uh, issues around sexuality, that kind of stuff, these all go to a base set of, of, um, of us, uh, imprinting, if you would, on your brain, what I call the routine engine. And it's your, your routines, mm -hmm. what you believe, are about you and their images, languages, and emotions that form the foundation. I mean, they literally get buried into your brain, much like the routines of riding a bike. I mean, think about it. How do we ride a bike, something that's complicated as balancing and pedaling and navigating and not crashing and stuff like that, while having a conversation with somebody right next to you who's riding the bike too? Because your brain's routine engine has already learned that and is handling it for you. So your subconscious mind is handling these basic things such as breathing, you know, um, you know, bodily functions, keeping the whole environment alive. And early on, this stuff was all gained when we we're young. And so you people at the subconscious level have all these worthiness issues, worthiness settings that happen at a very young age. And they don't understand that every decision as an adult they make is bounced against that framework. And then the decision of whether or not I should keep going with something will be evaluated against my setting of my worthiness. So it's kind of like a thermostat. So think about this. There's a worthiness thermostat. So every time the good in your life that keeps going up, going up, and you're getting, say you get sober or you get some money or you get a great job and all that kind of stuff like that, and you clip past the thermostat level for your worthiness, your subconscious mind, that routine engine will reach up grab you and pull you back down within the framework of what it's been taught is its settings. So that's why people don't understand why they do the things they do when sabotage kicks in. And it doesn't take long with a little bit of coaching and counseling that the, that the people will talk with you and you'll say, wow, when I was a kid, we really struggled with money. My mom and my dad always were very conservative with money. And we never could have more. And they had these bad impressions of what people with money would do. Like they may work for somebody with a lot of money and they really had bad experiences. So as a child, I learned that. So going into an adulthood, I could never hang on to money because having money was bad. Having money, having a lot of money was bad, right? It had nothing mm -hmm. to do with whether it was a right or wrong. It's just what my learning was taught that way. So until you're able to change those routines in your brain, the routine engine to have different language, emotions, and, and images around money, you will constantly build it up. It'll sabotage it to pull it back down again. And the book, The Bug in Our Brain, is about exactly that, finding those bugs and then using the routines that we have put in the book to help people pull it back and to break that level to set the thermostat to the next higher level of worthiness. It's an interesting so, process, wouldn't you agree? Oh, I, I totally agree. And, and I, I love your analogy with the thermostat. Yeah. You know, because at a certain point, if the temperature gets too high in your thermostat, I mean, it's either going to stop or explode, you know. So, right. but yeah, exactly. I, I guess what you're saying then is even if we have this threshold, we don't have to live the rest of our lives with that threshold. We can if we know about the threshold, we can move that threshold. That's exactly right. So here's, here's what we know is at least in our, in, in the practice at motive for life and the coaches that we have and the practice that we, that we provide as a service is that there is a baseline of worthiness that has to get in everybody's head. And that is basically I am worthy of love. I am um, a recipient, I am prosperous, the, the actual I am language. And this is very specific around um, the usage of the words so that they're um, very focused on um, language that can be installed in your brain habitually. This is very important, Chris. Um, the habitual nature of your subconscious has to be hijacked. So mm -hmm. for example, I talked about the routine process here. Um, people try to, at a conscious level, say, yeah, of course I'm worthy of this stuff. Of course I'm worthy of a raise. 
The problem is, is that you're showing up to a gunfight with a butter knife, right? Your subconscious is a mm -hmm. 10,000 times more stronger than your objective brain that you may be having a conversation with or listening to this, this, this piece here. For us, what we, what we did is, hey, you have to get into a 90-day daily routine of installing new language. And that means a set of affirmations and mantras that you read every single day, twice a day. And we use the same discipline that the military does. And that is, get it, how do you take an 18-year-old high school uh, graduate and turn him into a killing machine? 12 weeks of boot camp. Mm -hmm. Right? 90 days, right? Sound familiar? Yep. Sounds okay. very familiar. Sound familiar. So what we do is we're literally, for lack of better words, brainwashing ourselves to have higher self-worth. And then after the 90 days, people naturally start doing things that are supportive of themselves. And then it's a process of a, going through what we call 90 day sprints. Okay. The next 90 days is about being more focused on what you want to success. The next 90 days is about getting you focused on maybe financial attainment or wealth. The next 90 days might be around relationships. So each 90 day sprint is, is focused on, again, washing your brain of the old languages, images, and emotions that cause self-worth to be low. And if you think about some of the stuff that we've learned as part of the recovery world, um, consuming it in 90 day sprints is really something that most people understand and can do. Definitely. And, and 90 days, when you look at many behavioral studies, they show that that will imprint, as you're saying, you know, that this whole changing that routine engine, but from, yeah, that behavioral viewpoint, if you do the same behavior over and over for a good solid, you know, a few months, 90 days, yeah. uh, it's, it's now a part of you. It, it's now that new habit that you really don't have to think about. It's, it's just going to happen. So think about this, Chris. Think about if at night while you're sleeping or before you're eating dinner with a family member or something and your brain in the background is going, I am successful. I am successful. I am successful. I am successful. And it's doing it a thousand times in an hour. <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Right. And you that, that would change everything. That would change everything. I mean, I make good choices. What if that was the language of your brain? I make good choices. I am smart. I am lovable. I am beautiful. I love my body. I am a perfect human specimen. I am healthy. What if that was the mantra of, of language going through your head right now? Well, that changes all of your life. And it also, from the way that I view it and talk to my clients, is that then changes how you view the world around you. There you go. That's exactly. exactly. That's been my experience, and that's the experience for many of our clients. Now, is it automatic? No. Right? <laughs> There's, there's a depth to the water, right? <laughs> Everybody has their own depth. Uh, everybody well, has their own pool to go swimming in, right? As you talk about with the brainwashing, you know, we weren't brainwashed overnight. Nope. So it, it's not going to take, you know, a quick overnight to change the stories that we've been told and telling ourselves. Uh, it's going to take time. To that, to that extent, I wanted to let people know who are listening um, that if you, uh, we give away the most important um, exercise of the, of the book, The Bug in Our, Our Brain. It's called The Gift, and it's, a, it's something that we've been using for several years now, many years, that we've been distributing freely um, to any of the people who wanted to, you know, who maybe not could afford our services, but wanted to just make a start, right? And do the first 90 day sprint. It's the first 90 day sprint, Chris. And it's called Excellent. the gift. It's called the gift. And it's on our website, uh, uh, motiveforlife.com. That's M-O-T-I-V-E-F-O-R-L-I-F-E.com, motive for life. And it's free. And uh, I encourage anybody who's listening to go there, download it, and then start doing the exercises. It's a 90 day sprint. Um, and here's what happens, Chris, when everybody who's done it, who, according to the instructions, which is a twice a day reading, um, life takes off. It's crazy. I mean, I, I, have, I am constantly amazed at how fast 
things change for people once they start doing this. Mm. Um, and here's the other piece, though, and that this comes with an asterisk and a, and, and a bit of a uh, something to be aware of. You will run into your worthiness thermostat level. You will exceed it. And when you do exceed it, you may rationalize for yourself that I don't want to read it anymore. I'm uncomfortable. I have free floating anxiety and fear for no apparent reason. <laughs> um, people tend to get a little squirrely when they're above their thermostat level of worthiness. We call that the red zone. And when they're in the red zone, is when things get kind of nasty for them. They tend to self-sabotage, right? They tend to do these things and mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. I think they call it cognitive dissidence in the psychology world, right? Where you've got, right. Right, you got, you got the reality around you doing one thing, but if you don't believe you're worth the reality, then you've got a, a problem going on. So, Right, so and, and we also don't like change. So we tend to fall back to what we know, even if what we know is unpleasant uh, and the right. change is something pleasant, we're, we're more apt to go back to what we know than what we don't. That's the, and and I, that, the reason we don't like the change is because the worthiness is not at the level that would call for that change. Exactly. Yeah. So if the, if the listeners wish to, to get started on something, they can. Um, uh, we got a couple other resources there that are free. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, I, just, I just want people to start um, understanding that they don't have to suffer with this any longer if they don't want to. So what would motivate someone, you know, if we have a listener and, and this is very generous that you're offering this, if there's a listener who is at the point where their thermometer is down at the bottom, that yeah. they don't feel worthy of, of even doing this, how would we motivate someone or try to help them to have that better understanding that you are worthy to even try this? That's a great question, Chris. I think um, there has to still be some um, desire for change in the individual. Um, I've found myself offering it to people who simply don't want to change. There's not that, that they're, that they are, they feel that where they are right now is fine, even if it's from the outside looking in could be very difficult, right? But for them, they don't feel that they want to pick it up. There has to be a spark inside there someplace. There has to be something inside them that says, I am worthy of better. This is the key, this is the key statement that shows up in most people who are trying to come out of addiction or alcoholism, someone who's trying to lose weight, somebody who's trying to get a career change, somebody who doesn't want to work for a really difficult boss anymore, somebody who wants to get out of a bad relationship, someone who wants to do something, there is a spark inside them that says, I deserve better. I want better. And there's something out there that I know is better for me. If you are a person in that case right now, and you're hearing my voice, I recommend that you go get the gift and start. It will start you on the path. Is it the end path? No, but it will get you going. It'll get you moving in the right direction and you will elevate your self-worth to ask yourself the next question is, is what's next? What can I get better at? I do believe that this would build upon the successes that you are having. So right. if, if you do, as you move through, say this first one, the gift, and you do feel better about yourself, I don't see what would stop you from moving on to the next one. That's right. No, of course, the self-sabotage. But I mean, besides that, you know, we, you, would, you would desire more once you start knowing that it works. And I agree with the spark. I mean, I, I, I've seen the spark in people. Have you ever, though, in your experience found people who don't have the spark? Or do you believe that we all have it somewhere if we just look deeply enough? Uh, I think everybody has a spark if you're living. Um, the problem is, is that they've been so beaten down by the worthiness settings that they have today. They just don't think there's any way out. Um, so it could never happen for the, so for example, uh, yesterday, uh, I'm, I'm in Chicago today. So I live in Southern California, but I'm in Chicago for business okay. and I was walking on the street and I have a general rule that if someone comes up to me and asks me for money, I, I 
I give them what, whatever they ask for, right? Whatever they feel worthy of asking me. It's the question really how it works out. And um, some man asked me that and he, and he says, well, I just take whatever I can spare, right? And he's a homeless man. And I said, well, what do you want? And he looked at me and I go, what, what, do, you, what do you want? And he says, well, if you had $10, uh, uh, you know, that would help. All right, and there, there right there was the spark, right? Mm -hmm. right there. And I took out $10 and handed it to him and I said, I said, always ask for what you want. Because if, if you don't talk about what you want, then no one will ever know. And then you will constantly move forward. And you know, just for that moment there, he had that spark and somebody was listening to him about what was possible. What was possible? I, so I think it's available if somebody is willing to have the time or at least have a little compassion to listen to what they have to say and it'll come out. That, that's an awesome story on, on many levels, but the one thing that hit me with that story is you have an individual who has presumably not much or nothing up against a person who says, ask what you want. There's a part of me that would think, well, why would this guy not say, I want a thousand dollars. I want, you know, yes. this, this car. I, so I, I looked at this as you're saying, this as, as the perfect example of that unworthiness that he's going to ask for $10 when he could have asked. Now, I don't know if he get it, but you know, could have asked for a, bunch more than that that's right but kept it simple at 10 that really says a lot about what he feels about his own worth that's exactly right and so if he if, if he had asked me for 20 i would have given him a 20 and if he had asked me for 100 i would have given him 100 so that's a whole other practice i got a whole other thing i do when i carry money around me if someone comes up and asks me for to to help them out um i have an open metaphorical handshake, you know, an energy handshake that says, I will give you whatever you ask for. Cause I, cause I believe in flowing money, right? No matter who it is right. or where they are. Um, and so if, so I've had really interesting experiences around this, uh, by the way, Chris, this has been really a, a, a social test and worthiness. Like a gentleman, I walked by and I, I just passed him. I go, oh, you know, I forgot about my own rule, right? He had asked for money. I turned back around, I went and talked to him. I said, what do you need, man? He goes, he just looks at me. He goes, what I really need is I need $40 to get off the street. And I took out $40 and I handed it to him and he just started crying, right? Mm -hmm. He just started crying and weeping. And, he, and I said, just ask for what you need, man. Because no one's going to know what you need unless you ask them specifically what you need. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a practice that I encourage everybody to try. Um, it really frees you from the obligation of trying to figure out what they're going to do with the money. I don't care if he's going to go get drunk with $40. I don't care. I mean, whatever it takes. That's right? on him, not on you. That's right. And that's, that's even okay with me. It's, he has permission from me. Go. Go. You know, do what you got to do. But, but know that there's somebody else that listens to you and it cares. So, you know, Crystal, back to the spark, right? How does the gift work with those who are listening who are dealing with afraid to ask for a raise and they know they're worth it, right? How do they, how do I, you know, go on a date with somebody and it might be a woman or a guy who I'm really attracted to, but I don't know how to ask, right? How do I, how do I, you know, maybe save up enough to get a house, but, but every time I get myself in credit card debt and I don't know why. I mean, these are real ABC practical navigation of life problems that everybody is coming up against it right now, specifically in our time mm -hmm. and world, man. I mean, we need to be better on ourselves right now. We, we beat ourselves up way too much. We do. we do. And in the book, in the book, there are multiple exercises. There's like seven or eight of them in the back, but there's a bunch in the, that spread out that will give people some, just some, some very simple tactics to use to change the language in their head, Chris. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a passion of mine, as you can hear my voice, right? <laughs> oh, most definitely. Yeah. It's a passion of mine. I just, I just, you know, I just want people to know that you, you can, you can feel better about yourself and it's okay. It's not um, ego when you say I'm worthy of wealth because wealth means influence. And if you do it with a good heart, 
you can influence a lot of good. It really does come down to motive and, and what you are geared for within your own value and, and moral structure. So right. I would totally agree with that. It, it's not the wealth itself that is the problem. It's what people do or don't do with the wealth that becomes the issue for the rest of society and, and humanity. That's exactly right. So my, my, like I told you, I flow money. Um, you know, I, I, if we, the launch of the book, um, we're dedicating the first months of the um, sales of the book to a charity of a good friend of mine. Her name's uh, Laura Manfrey and her daughter's uh, charity. It's a, it's a Sophia sees hope. It's a genetic disease. And her daughter had uh, was blind. I mean, excuse me, was sight had sight and then lost her sight through a, a genetic uh, problem and they got a cure for it. So we're really focusing on that and advocacy. So, you know, we're just trying to flow everything here to make sure that the uh, money's going to the right places and the right people. Um, I've been pretty blessed since I've been doing this, uh, uh, and uh, I continue to want to encourage people to take action in these areas. Um, you know, my, to be perfectly straight with you, I'm, I love the technology industry. I'm a cloud computing executive. I've started cloud computing companies, and I still am actively involved with that. But this is my passion. You know, my day-to-day -day passion is to make sure that all people in all areas know that that lifting self-worth is a valuable thing. And I'm so glad that that's your passion because we, we need that in our society. Yeah. You know, as we were talking at the beginning of this, you know, that just think about if more people would know their self-worth, be comfortable with their self-worth, be proud of their self-worth. That's right. Where would we be as a culture and civilization and it would be totally different than what it is now. Oh my gosh. I mean, first off, the first thing that happens with someone with higher self-worth is they never, ever harm another person. It's, 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 a, it's a stunning thing. As the person continues to go up the ladder of worthiness, they recognize that the person next to them is human and is connected to them. And as I because I would never hurt another individual because what I'm really doing is hurting myself. Right. Right. Um, and if, because I'm worthy of a healthy life and a, and a well being, why would I hurt myself? I wouldn't. Therefore I treat you with as much love as I treat myself. And exactly. It's an amazing handshake. Actually. It's wonderful. That this whole thing is wonderful. And, and it's amazing in some ways in its simplicity, but in the other ways where we just don't think in these terms. We complicate all of this and confuse it all when really it does come down to this. But that self-sabotage is going to get in the way. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing. And I can't wait for the book to come out. You'll definitely have to let us know when the book is out. Yeah, so I that, will. Uh, you know, as I want to promote that, you know, all around as much as we can and definitely get our uh, listeners to – you know, purchase the book and read it. Um, for those who do want to know about like the book release and, and more about mm -hmm. you, what is the best way that they can find that out? Uh, go on to, well, we got a couple of avenues. Um, go to motiveforlife.com. Uh, the announcement will be there. There's um, uh, a page up there that's very easy to find called the bug in our brain. It's the landing page for the, for the book. Um, uh, the bug in our brain .com, uh, will route you there as well. Um, and you can all, people can also find me if you're a professional, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Robert Christensen, uh, that's C H R I S T I A N S E N Robert Christensen. Um, and then, uh, you can, you can follow me on that page. So that I, I write a lot of for, for, for professionals there as well. So you'll see a lot of leadership around elevating self-worth. You'll see a lot of, um, uh, articles around how do you bring this methodology into the business world. So for example, uh, we had a meditation for business piece coming out here shortly. Nice. And yeah, yeah, it's fun. And then um, we have uh, on Facebook, uh, Motive for Life, there's a page on that as well that uh, is just coming live, but I'm very pleased about as well. So um, uh, the coming out party is becoming accelerated, Chris, and I'm very pleased <laughs> about that. So <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. The, the sooner people can get, get this in their hands, the better we're all going to be. Yes. Um, 
And for the listeners, you know, I'm going to put in the uh, show notes the link, the motiveforlife.com. And I really do encourage everyone to check out uh, the gift. I mean, seeing that it is a gift from you and at least to get everyone started in, in thinking this way and beginning to increase our, our own self-worth. So yeah. in a sense, you're, you're prompted and ready for the book. That's right. So, that's right. Yep. You know, um, that's exactly it. And, and we're not asking for email, uh, emails or anything like that. This is strictly your gift. We're not asking for anything. I just download it and go. And then come awesome. back and see us. If you, if we very much would like to hear what your experience is. If you want to post your experience on Motive for Life on the Facebook page, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, so the there's really no reason not to pick up the gift because right. all of your privacy concerns, all of your you know money concerns, whatever, there isn't any. There, you there just go get it. Just go get it. It's free. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> go get it. Practice it, and then pick up the book well, and I, continue on. I, I think, Chris, I think about all my training as a marketer and the years I've been doing this stuff like that, you know, to give away something without an email or something like that in exchange. And I thought to myself, you know what? We just, we just need to get this out, and it's important. Well, I, I appreciate that you're doing that. You know, yeah, I just do. It does get in the way. I mean, I, I know for my own – this it, it's just important to get this out to everybody yep awesome well thank you uh for your time and everything that you've shared and you know your wisdom and insights in this there's a lot of practical things that the listeners can do and uh once again it's motiveforlife.com i will post that and please everyone go out and get the gift and just get started so thank you again for joining us thank you chris Appreciate the time. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.